Hey, good morning, everybody. How are you doing? Uh, Kathy is not with us today. She's doing well. Uh, she's a little bit busy with a special project. And we have today uh, Roman. Here's Roman. How are you doing, Roman? I'm good. How are you guys doing? Thanks for having me on your show. Great. So today we're going to spend uh, a few, uh, I would call that quality moment with Roman. And uh, we're going to talk about his approach um, in terms of training, behavior, and things like that. And, and the first uh, point of conversation, if I use that expression, is probably at the time where the puppy is born. And this is a, f a very critical phase in the life of the puppy. And Roman, can you just describe to us how important is that moment and what would be the impact uh, for the life of the, of the puppy from there? Oh, I lost your sound. Can you hear me now? Yes. Good. Perfect. Um, um, that's a very interesting question, and it's actually very important, especially because when we um, observe dogs in nature, we see that they are in a family bond, and in that family bond, dogs are going through an imprint period. Um, it's the period where the puppy recognizes his parents as a safe source of information, care, trust, safety, and that is what makes the parent actually parent. Um, there, there are diff different mechanics happening here um, where because of the puppy ha does a specific actions, the, the parents are responding to those actions and those actions that respond from the parents will trigger the puppy um, to evolve and, and learn and um, build his uh, environmental experience um, that happens that that basically knowledge doesn't stop until the puppy is an adult um, where the puppy starts disconnecting from his parents and start creating his own families now when we're taking in um, puppies into our home after about eight or 12 weeks um, this is a switching point where the puppy switches from being only together with this you know confined family um, being a little bit more outgoing and start meeting different environmental triggers. Now, for us, it's important because we become a part of the puppy's life as a second parent. Uh, and that period, we switch from the parents of the original, the original parents of the puppy into our parenting. And this transition is kind of critical because if we don't understand the puppy's needs and the puppy's um, functional and emotional needs, we will not be able to provide what the parents provided. And that will basically be a disconnect. Uh, we see that if we are not creating a secure attachment relationship from the very beginning of our you know, new relationship, um, the puppies usually will disconnect, will start continuing doing his own stuff and his breed trait will come to surface. So um, breed traits are the ones that make the puppy behave a certain way, like the breed that like it was bred mm -hmm. for. But the environmental factors is what affect the puppy to modify that behavior and adjust according to his to his environment, uh, and that's about, where we come in. Yeah, about this this point, when somebody go to the nursery and pick up a puppy, and you have different behavior. Uh, let's say you have like f five six puppy from the same mother, and they have all different behavior what will be a factor when the person decide to adopt one puppy versus the other puppy? Uh, some are more dominant, some are more confident, you will say, and some are less yeah. confident. I'm, I'm not taking the, the, the term dominant, I'm taking the term confident because um, there, there are breeds that are more confident as you know, individual puppies that are more confident than others. It's kind of like with people, you have a sibling and the sweet sibling is more confident. And even if you have twins, the one is more confident, the other one is less confident. It's kind of like a dynamic that happens here and happens with puppies as well. Um, I don't want to go too deep into you know, the genome and you know how, how the genetics work. But overall, we would say that each individual puppy has specific um, 
individual traits besides the the classic breed traits that we know. So um, a bull mastiff will behave like a bull mastiff, and um, a great Pyrenees will behave like a great Pyrenees, and a border collie will behave like a border collie. However, each individual dog will have individual perceptions, the way he feels about things. And so mm -hmm. their emotional factor kicks in. And also how the environment, how he reacts to the environment, that makes him function differently. And since we know from, from people research and we can compare children with um, with dogs at that pain from a, from a level their emotional perception happens, uh, we can see that secure attachment relationship with children towards the parents is secure about 36% of all the children. So we see that it's not perfect world around humans and their children, and it's not a perfect world around dogs and their parents. So we have similar struggles, mm -hmm. but that makes it so unique because each dog has a unique perception, which makes each dog unique. Now it depends on us. When we take the puppy out of a litter, mm -hmm. how we engage and how we parent that puppy to create more as an ethics if we provide struct family structure and family code of conduct, just continue doing what the parents would do. Okay. In in the, the context where the puppy moved from uh, the nursery, I will call that, to a new house and a new environment, what is important for the puppy uh, to feel secure and comfortable and welcome there? I would I would ask a counter question to those people who, who watch us and I really appreciate for your feedback. Oops, sorry, let me make that quiet here. Um, I want to think about what would make our child comfortable in that house? What makes it feel good and safe and nurtured? All these environmental factors we have to create for the puppy, create a safe place where the puppy feels safe in that family. Include that family, that dog in our family by creating a clear, instructions and clear structure, um, be very clear about the emotional messages we send. If I uh, have a fake happy face uh, or I'm angry about that puppy, these are emotional information that a puppy seeks. So we have a lot of communication skills that we have to catch up in order to be able to communicate with our dogs. And actually I was um, working out on a workshop that I have in the very near future about how dogs communicate with their people. And so I want to make aware of people, how many information um, are we exchanging from visual into um, from the smell, from the body language, and even of our position in relationship with our parent. All these are information that we have to provide. So I see many people who try really um, to communicate with their dogs. We lack on that language and misinterpret signals and take signals as you know, oh, my puppy is wagging his tail. He's happy. But we don't see exactly how the puppy is wagging his tail. It, that is a very intense wagging mm -hmm. tail. It's not happy wagging tail. And if the puppy has his tail up wagging versus have the tail like wagging normal, horizontal, or in between the legs, there are two different situations. Mm -hmm. And then we have to understand that that communication that we try to achieve, it has to do a context with the situation. Like if mm -hmm. a puppy is happy wagging his tail while trying to bite somebody, it's not because he, he is happy to see you, it's because he's happy doing that job that you consider aggressive. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so these are kind of miscommunication we have to clear up in order to parent the puppy correctly. Right. This is part of, a, I would call it the part of education. Uh, there's a part where the dog needs to learn about the handler, the human, and the human right. has a part to learn about the dog and understand uh, body language, uh, other expression that the dog give cue to the human say, hey, hey I'm here, I'm here, I'm here. Uh, <laughs> we, <laughs> we come across a video it, that might be a good illustration of interaction between a dog and human. It's involved you and it's involved a dog. It's an exercise about leash. Uh, training. Oh, I know. Yes. Let me give you a small introduction to that Please. one. Please. Tibon is a two time shelter surrender. So he was surrendered to do aggression to its rescue. And from a rescue, he was surrendered to a trainer to do aggression because they tried to avoid putting him down. Mm -hmm. um, the shorter story behind that was 
that the dog was in the first family home, that he was in an abusive relationship with his parents to the point that there was intervention, um, tactical intervention, the dog was removed and then he was placed to another home. And unfortunately the second owner um, had a dramatic incident in the house. And so he couldn't care for the dog anymore. And so the dog ended up in a shelter and that declined. Mm -hmm. uh, from a breed, he is a Chinook dog. Um, okay. It's an it's a North American specialty breeds, but you know, let's watch the video. Okay, let's get to the video. I'll share the screen with all of us, and you can do a live comment on that. Oops, I have. Okay, that. that's T Bone. Yeah. Oops. So my Maybe. goal was here in the very beginning to um, show people a little bit about force-free training. I kind of got in a run because many people use prong collars and e-collars to um, do this. So I, I use T-Bone, who is usually, um, I, I was still with working with him, so I used that education video. So mm -hmm. what we see right now is we have T-Bone start pulling on the leash a little bit. So I see, I show you with my two fingers how much he pulls. Yeah, yeah. So I'm teaching him now is that, that as soon as it would create a resistance, on that leash, which is not a technique that I use usually, but I pre pretend to be the client where the dog ends the leash and the dog stops and then makes a U-turn, try to understand why we stopped. And then he mm -hmm. makes that turn. Mm -hmm. Then I make it turn 180 degrees <coughs> and go in the direction my dog expect me to go. But then I stop letting him know because you went forward and ahead of me, I will not go in the direction that you thought I would go, but I will change my direction. So basically I show him that he cannot predict where I'm going, but in order for him to be in alignment with my intentions, I want him to be next to me. And you see every turn the dog mm -hmm. kind of align himself and he starts to be in my visual. By the way, he saw a cat on the other end of our parking lot. So that's why he got several interested like we see right now, which is a good thing to do because now I dropped the leash. I want to show you that once the dog understands the job description, he's willing to comply with it without any force. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, when I was cool. watching the video, the exp I look at the expression of the dog and the expression vary from the start to the yeah. end of the video. Yeah, we see very, very a lot of signals of ears, head position, her legs, his body language, even his position where he is next to me in alignment. And so now I help the dog once I, I describe the job description now I help him understand and troubleshoot his own situation that he created by telling him that's not what I expect you to do can you can you fix it for me and then I come in with reward that's fantastic and we see the transformation uh, of the relationship it's a short video but in that very short video it's amazing the transformation you see there the interaction yeah. change completely between the beginning and the end of the video. Right. I use that particular video because it's one of my dogs that I usually not use on the leash. So he's not used mm -hmm. to walk on the leash a lot because usually mm -hmm. he's off the leash. Right. But um, I wanted to, to have people see what happens with your own dog, what you can do with your own dog that already trusts you. Yeah. Now, um, of course, there are other videos there to explain different ways. And I think you picked a very good one uh, about a Great Dane. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I, I, which I don't have with me today, but oh. um, uh, but it's it's another video we can watch a little bit later. I can put that, a link so people can uh, uh, mm -hmm. retrieve it and watch the video with the Dane. Um, but as you see right now, they are very close. It, the dog is very close to you. Right. And as you stop, the dog stop. And as the video progress is getting closer and closer to you, so it, like you stop, you stop at the same time. And that's a synchronization. And that's right. what the big difference is. Once a dog has established a secure attachment relationship, he starts to be more synchronized with his partner. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So yeah. the white dog is basically deaf and blind. <laughs> so okay. it's kind of like go wherever everybody goes, <laughs> tries to keep in between. Okay, that's nice to know that part. So I, I'm not very very picky about how accurate my dog is in a heel position because all I want my dog has to have a specific freedom of movement around around myself. Now we are restricted from a legal perspective to have dogs on the leash. Yeah. And I feel the six foot leash is pretty much a good safe distance between 
me, the dog, and another person. Um, and that's why I'm showing that exercise with a six foot leash and not with a long leash. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we see the dog has such a sensitive neck that he can feel the tension, the weight of the leash. So right. he can regulate himself how much pressure he wants to have on that leash. Yeah. And I'm not going in to create that pressure. He creates his pressure on his own. Right. You so just stop there. Back. Yeah, uh, yeah. It's a remarkable. In a short period of time, how much progress there, how much better communication and connection there is between you and the dog. Right, right. That's because there was a cat back there somewhere. So I see a couple of questions coming in. Yeah. Um, let me know when we want to address those. Okay. Let's see, where is the question? I have this one, whoops. Is that visible? Let me show. Anyway. Okay, Rosie, can you tell me how to stop my dog being nervous outside? That's a good question. Actually, this is a, a very, um, very usual behavior. Dogs get overwhelmed if they feel insecure outside, especially if there is no secure bond between the owner and the dog. And I don't want to take anybody in person, but it's the way the dog perceives that relationship is not how we see it because we love our dog and because we care up for our dog and because we bring him a home and we rescued him. That doesn't include the dog's emotional relationship with us. Um, there are different ways to connect with people. For example, it could be a secure attachment relationship or insecure attachment relationship. And dogs who come <clears throat> and had an interesting experience or, you know, an, an aversive experience outdoors, they feel nervous going outside. Usually these are dogs who have not been socialized proper, meaning mm -hmm. is in early puppyhood where they should include and learn what to do and how to handle situations, car passing by, people walking on the streets, dog, dogs barking in the neighborhood and we're not giving the proper signals, that can cause anxiety um, to the dogs every time he's going outside. Now, one thing that I highly recommend with people is to start establishing an emotional connection with the dog and start being responsive to how the dog feels about it, which means as soon as we go outside and um, we are in the position of putting the leash on, if we feel the dog being nervous about that, just giving the dog a little bit more time to calm down, to relax. And that will be our response for the dog's emotional state. Mm -hmm. And that the dog will perceive as a support. Yeah. I have a comment. When I saw the video the first time, I, I was impressed by the fact there was no, um, oh, I can say that nicely. There was no correction, uh, or, aggressive correction or aggressivity. Because there's some school of training, it's a reward and punishment. Some other are reward, reward, and nothing, or reward, or nothing. But mm. your approach is um, almost more telepathic, more <laughs> sensitive, more attentive to what the dynamic. Um, this is correct. Um, I, I wouldn't say it's telepathic, but kind of sort of it is because dogs communicate with each other in a telepathic way. They just know the situation. They feel mm -hmm. they're emotionally connected. If it's a prey or a predator, they just know how it feels uh, on the other side. We sit in the bus and all of a sudden we feel somebody's watching us and we turn our head and indeed he's watching us. How do we do that? We feel it emotionally because we feel that energy coming in. So when, when I handle with dogs, the first thing I want to convey the information that I'm listening to your messages. I'm listening right. what I perceive. I listen of your body language. I listen to your smell. I listen um, to everything that happens around me and with, with the dog, which makes the dog calm down instantly. So there is no reason for me to add a punishment in that equation that doesn't mean that there are no consequences but people confuse consequences with punishment a consequence of um being too harsh 
wanting the treat that I have in my hand will be, you will not be able to get that treat. So the dog is forced in order to troubleshoot the situation to offer me an alternative behavior that mm -hmm. I will then reward as a consequence to his behavior. So a consequence is nothing else that I do something and my environment responds to that. The consequence of me punishing against the wall is that I get hurt, but it's mm -hmm. me who did it. It wasn't the wall. The wall was just there waiting for me to punch mm -hmm. it, right? And so I, I see that dogs have, have motivations and motives to do certain behaviors. And I, I understand that a dog wants to be perfect because this is what includes him in the particular group that he chooses to be with. Mm -hmm. And so I'm not giving that opportunity for him to be perfect and being supportive, like authoritative um, to his experience, then he would get stressed because he doesn't know how to be perfect. He doesn't know how, what I'm expecting him to do. And that's right. why I have to give clear information and clear instructions, reward him for each individual task that he offers, and then build up the job description, just like I would do with a human person that is just being hired in a company has never worked before. Mm -hmm. I see that you reach a point in your career where uh, you have a, a pretty good understanding of the interaction between animal, dogs, and human. What is your background? Where, how did you did you reach that point? What was the, your short story in about three minutes? Three minutes. Okay, I keep it very short. Um, I'm coming you from find the fact that you're born. <laughs> <laughs> well, it starts there. Um, okay. Uh, short. Um, I'm coming from a traumatic experience as a child, and that experience was carried with me for a very long time, which makes me very sensitive to certain, you know, emotional, um, mm -hmm. environmental triggers. Um, I'm coming as from, from educational part, from engineering background as industrial engineer and system integration, which gives me a better understanding on how systems are built and how to break down individual, you know, uh, tasks into into components that I eventually can create an automation around that and start creating and imitating a person or a handling that a human would do in industrial um, proportions. Now, I did that for 25 years and I didn't like the fact that I had to deal with a lot of, you know, companies that not reflecting my, my belief system. So I, I turned my back on that and, and I was happy in that switching point um, to have more time for the dogs and something that I love to do. Um, and for some point I was starting doing more care and boarding and fostering, but in that, you know, friction that I had with, you know, dealing with so many dogs, I also uh, try to help people who boarding their dogs and fosters who, who are coming and leaving the dogs with me for training and then going back to foster care. And so the, there was a lot of experience around foster care, around parenting, around dealing with aggressive dogs, dealing with traumatized dogs. And since I came in also from a trauma experience and have a journey also as a healer, um, going through that process of healing myself out of those situations, I saw that my experience through that aspect helped me deal with dogs who have traumatic experience. And then all of a sudden I recognized that all these behaviors that we call aggressive or, or um, um, reactive are stemming for an emotional trauma. So I start digging deeper into that, uh, like a beagle, and and all of on a dachshund, and then all of a sudden I recognize there is a big, a big thing behind that trauma. They're all the dogs have trauma. Most of them, like let's say ninety percent of those dogs have trauma that are in a pet environment, like in a home environment, while other dogs who roam free, which is about eight hundred million dogs, don't have that trauma. They literally just shake it off. Now, our pets cannot shake it off because this trauma is so deep reinforced by everyday interactions. And I said that that has to stop. What can I do to stop that from happening? So that became a mission at some point. And I said, I need my experience as a human coming from an abusive you know, environment, going into understanding the dogs have been the same thing that I have been through. And mm -hmm. now we can connect those dots together. And I said, we can... I can share that information that I have with people, the like clients, and also with co fellow colleagues who, who want to look deeper into that and kind of widen up their, their idea of classical conditioning into emotional healing of dogs. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I think I, we're in three minutes. <laughs> that's okay. <laughs> no, I, th I thank you for sharing that. And uh, thank you for being with us today for the show. 
Uh, this is like just scratching the top of the iceberg. Uh, that's just the tip of the iceberg. And uh, I would like to conclude the show today and I have an invitation to have you to contribute in the future with our show on a regular basis. Uh, you're a very positive uh, note to our uh, production and we really Thank appreciate you so your contribution there. So we'll come back with more, more topic and more subject and we'll have you again and again and again. Thank you for your uh, thank you so much. Thank you so really being so sensitive. That. And everybody, thank you for watching. If you find anything interesting in this show, whisper that to your friend. Let them know. And uh, your comments are always welcome. If you have any video of your dog, lovely video of your dog, please send us a copy. Uh, we have the project to do a compilation at some point and uh, do a special show on the best of your dogs so we'll talk to you next week uh, be well under the circumstance uh keep your physical distance but no man, humanly, in the house. yes and nor and and get very close emotionally to your dear one around you thank you for that and we'll see you very soon thank you thank you bye bye